Disciples Net. We are so glad you're here today to worship with us. Sit back and enjoy this time as we worship God together. Thank you for being here. Our reading is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 15. The point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under a compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to provide you with every blessing in abundance, so that by always having enough of everything, you may share abundantly in every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way for your great generosity, which will produce thanksgiving to God through us. For the rendering of this ministry not only supplies the needs of the saints, but also overflows with many thanksgiving to God. Through the testing of this ministry, you glorify God by your obedience to the confession of the gospel of Christ and by the generosity of your sharing with them and with all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of your surpassing grace of God that he has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Will you join me in prayer? Gracious God, you supply your people with every blessing in abundance. Lift up our hearts in gratitude this day. Help us, we pray, to thank you for the gifts that we seldom notice, to praise you for the blessings we often take for granted, and to glorify your name for how you have watched over us. 
Help us to give as you give and share as you share. As you clothe us with grace and mercy, may we share with those who have so little. As you give us joy and hope in sadness and despair, as our hearts overflow with your love and wonder, may we offer them as gifts to everyone we meet. As you give food and drink to those who hunger and thirst, as you feed us with joy and hope, may we welcome to the table all those whose lives are filled with tears and pain. And as you give justice and mercy to those who cry out for both, and give truth to those who have been deceived, and love to those who are lost, may we continue to give thanks to the gift of Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. Free us from all worry and fear, that in trusting in your goodness, we may always praise your mighty deeds. We offer our prayers on behalf of the church and the world, more from our need to be transformed by our awareness of them than from any need of you to be reminded of them. We make our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, says Paul. Which gifts do you bring? I know it's still a recession. We're still struggling economically, but things are looking up. But I know that even in those kinds of circumstances, everyone, everyone has a gift to bring. I think about Evangelina, a woman from Haiti who, when I asked her what I could pray for for her, she said to me, Oh no, honey, I'll pray for you, because I know that it's far more dangerous to have too much than to not have enough. Thanks to your gifts to Week of Compassion, the Relief, Refugee, and Development Fund of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, we are literally all over the world. And while we're not always the first to arrive on the scene post-disaster, I can assure you that we are almost always among the last to leave, even in a place like Bosnia, where we are still working to sustain ongoing development needs. Let me paint a picture for you of what Bosnia looks like. Crystal clear, jade-colored rivers, breathtaking mountains, the one-of-a-kind tall and cone-shaped haystacks that decorate the Bosnian countryside, the strong coffee cooked on the stove with a rich, sticky piece of baklava. And in the capital of Sarajevo, it is within walking distance from the Catholic Cathedral to the Serbian Orthodox Church to the Jewish synagogue to Bay's Mosque, the most magnificent in all the city. But of course, as always, God's creative work most comes to life in the spirit of Bosnia's people. In 1995, I began my work as a missionary to this war-torn land. It's hard for me to believe that it was so long ago, for it stays with me so powerfully. At that time, it was in the middle of a fierce war in Bosnia and Herzegovina under the threat of siege and sniper fire that a member of the Sarajevo Philharmonic Orchestra took out his dusty tuxedo, found his cello that somehow miraculously survived the war, and walked to the heap of rubble which once was the National Library. It was there he began to play Albinoni's Adagio in G minor. 
This would be like losing our Library of Congress. It was in the midst of that kind of heaps of rubble, that unfathomable destruction, that he played a song of resistance to honor the 42 people who had just lost their lives while standing in a bread line the week before. Wanting to do something, anything, this cellist offered what he could. He had no money and even risked his life by leaving his home to dodge the bullets and sniper fire. But he gave what he could give. And in that moment, his music offered hope to the people of Sarajevo and across Bosnia. During the same season of war, the members of St. Anthony's parish would gather after mass to sing together throughout the four years of the siege of their beloved city of Sarajevo. Climbing the stairs of that old church to the second floor balcony where the organ resided, folks would huddle around the instrument I remember so well, and we would sing favorite hymns and folk songs. And for a moment, we would forget our troubles and rediscover our joy. We would laugh out loud as we attempted to belt out songs louder than the bombs. And there I was, a young missionary with a naive plan to bring comfort and good news to these people. Yet they, of course, were the ones offering me a lesson about how God works to heal. Those of us who gathered to sing during the war would often organize impromptu parties, finding a safe place to meet, usually in the basement of the Franciscan monastery and church where we would meet. And there we would sing and continue to dance and tell jokes long after mass rehearsals. At times there was food and drink during those impromptu parties. People would bring what they had, which wasn't much, of course, but what they had to offer, they would lay at the table for everyone to share. Sometimes it was a bar of chocolate, which, let me say, was like a bar of gold during those days. Sometimes it was homemade juice or tea made from dried elderflowers. Regardless of what it was, I would marvel at their generosity, which flew right in the face of their poverty. And whenever something was offered, it was always put on the table, and somebody would then say, Hvala Bogu, thanks be to God. They were grateful to God. They had something to give. I learned something in that beautiful yet war-torn land about how God's creative work comes to life, moving towards beauty and wholeness and restoration when God's people offer what they can. When God's people live as if their faith and values matter in the midst of chaos, living as if that offering really did make a difference. And I can assure you, it was the only thing that did. For everyone, everyone has the opportunity to participate in God's redeeming work in the world. Everyone has a gift to bring. The Apostle Paul's gift, as we heard in our text, was his passion for the gospel. When Paul visited the early churches in Macedonia, they became excited about the ministry opportunities laid before them and couldn't help but get caught up in Paul's zeal for the ways God was moving in their midst. So much so that they actually begged, yes, the churches begged to be a part of this service to the saints that Paul spoke of, even though they were themselves quite poor. Now this service to the saints referred to in 2 Corinthians is just another name for the offering Paul and the churches were organizing for the churches in distant Jerusalem who were at that time experiencing an awful famine. To organize a church-wide offering, a relief fund was not only practical in leveraging funds so that they could make the most impact together, but was also a visible expression of their Christian unity. The offering was a way for Paul to model the unity of all believers and to provide a way for them to care for each other, even if they didn't know each other personally. For the churches in Macedonia and Corinth, many of them would never see or meet the Christians they were helping in Jerusalem. So their church-wide offering was a concrete representation of the gospel, that in Christ there truly was no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, no longer separation or division, 
but instead unity in Christ Jesus. For the point is this, the one who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the one who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. We know the text so well. Each of you must give as you have made up your mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Paul seems to be suggesting that followers of Jesus may have a responsibility to allow others to see, learn, and get inspired by the way they give so that they can in turn participate in that giving, in the joy of giving. Now many of us I know have learned that it is bad spiritual form, if you will, to make our giving a matter of public pride. But Paul prompts us here to understand sacred giving as both a private and a public act. It's why we receive an offering each and every Sunday as a corporate body, many of us. Perhaps Paul is even hinting that giving strictly privately takes away part of the meaning and power of giving. The early Christians are encouraged here to share the joy in giving by letting others witness their generosity so that all, all may see how God is being glorified. We do not give to get praise or recognition ourselves. We give to glorify God. I'll never forget one of our disciples' congregations in Missouri who received a special offering for all of those affected by the rash of hurricanes that we witnessed in 2005. Katrina, Rita, Wilma. After the service, as the deacons and the church treasurer went through the cash and the checks placed in the offering plates, they came across something that was not paper. It wasn't a check or an offering envelope or a bill. They looked at it and got concerned that perhaps this had fallen off of someone's finger. Certainly it had been a mistake. They looked closer at the object to find some initials engraved on the inside of the ring. Recognizing the initials, they called the person to whom it belonged in the congregation. The owner, a woman whose husband had recently died, decided the best way to remember him was to give to others what he had given her. Her precious wedding band symbolized the great love she had experienced with her husband, and now it was time to pay it forward. She donated her wedding ring as that is what she had. She wanted to respond to those she was afraid would otherwise be forgotten. She gave what she had to give. For 69 years now, we have been making a difference as the church through Week of Compassion, glorifying God. We have been funding relief and development all over the world in places like Joplin, Missouri, the Gulf South, Haiti, the Congo, the Horn of Africa, Syria, New York, New Jersey, and Newtown, Connecticut. And these are responses that we have made in just the past months. All that is ours is God's, so everyone has a gift to give. And as I close, I want to share with you a story that will stick with me forever. For nowhere have I witnessed that confession of faith. The act of giving back to God is living out our confession of faith. Nowhere have I experienced that more powerfully than when I was last in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. There's a disciples church on stilts in a fishing village. Folks set up a camp of sorts along the mighty Congo River where they could fish and make some semblance of a living. Fishing meant survival for most of the members of this fishing community. I preached that rainy afternoon, my sermon translated by one of the members into the local language of Lingala, and when I finished, I sat back down in my seat. What came next was extraordinary. I watched the members of the church dance forward their offerings. I'm serious when I say they danced forward their offerings. They were thrilled, overjoyed that they had something to give. This was the highlight of their worship experience. Praise be to God for the opportunity to give what we have, they exclaimed. And I was overcome by their joy in doing so. And just when I thought it was over, 
That marvelous African beat continued. They kept dancing. The women ululated. They continued to sing. They were invited to give a second offering. Another offering, I thought. This would never fly in our churches at home. This time they brought forward their gifts for me, the preacher. What? For me? I could hardly believe it. Their tradition to offer gifts of gratitude for the one who attempted to share a word from God was overwhelming to me. But what was even more remarkable was that they were singing when they received the offering. Praise be to God that we actually have something to give. What a privilege. And so I graciously, despite my disbelief, accepted the three fish that were brought forward and the long branch of plantains, the oranges, the papayas, and some spare change. I felt strange about accepting it, I'll admit. But I know that to honor the giver, you honor the gift. Honor the gifts you have been given by the Holy One who first breathed life into you. For it is to that gracious, generous, great God that we give all the glory. Thanks be to God for all the gifts you bring. so appreciative for Reverend Gop for coming and sharing with us that wonderful message, especially for this time that we have set aside in our church to celebrate and recognize the Week of Compassion. This week coming up celebrates this ministry that's called Week of Compassion that does so much good around the world. We invite you now to come and share in this offering. If you would like to give to the Week of Compassion offering specifically, which we encourage, you can do that through our website. You can mail a letter to the address that's here, or you can go through or the giving page on our website and do so, and just designate that as a Week of Compassion offering. And all of that goes to the Week of Compassion. 
If you would like to contribute to the ministry of Disciples Net Church, we are most grateful for your participation in this ministry that's going around the world. And we invite you to give those gifts at this time too. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for a world that you have asked us to participate in your ministry, to help be your hands and feet and heart around the world. Bless now the gifts that we bring, whatever they may be. Bless them as they are used in your service. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. We've been gifted with Amy Gopp's sermon today. She is the executive in charge of a ministry that does so much good. We are so blessed with abundance and the object of the sermon is to sow the word, the word of Jesus, the word of God, and be able to offer the seeds of faith and of hope and of goodness to everyone we meet. We come now to the table of the Lord the place of the most abundant gift we could ever ask for. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks for this time where we can come together and remember your life, your death, and your rebirth, your overcoming death. May this bread and the fruit of these grapes be a reminder for us that we too can overcome the death obstacles in our lives. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. In this season, we're invited to share our bounty with others. And no one shared more than Jesus, who shared his life and gave everything he had so that we would follow him and be servants to one another. And so we remember at this time, the last time that Jesus gathered with his disciples at a meal. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body that is given for you. As often as you eat it, do so in remembrance of me. And after supper was done, Jesus poured the final cup and he blessed it before he shared it with his disciples. And he said to them, take this, all of you, and drink it. For this is the blood of my life given for you. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Come.
Go now in peace aware that you have a gift, a unique, special gift that only you can bring. And it's that gift that the world is waiting for. Go now confident in your gift bringing. Praise be to God.